Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sophia Gaston, and I'm the director of the British Foreign Policy Group. It's a real pleasure to have you um, all with us today for this uh, incredibly timely conversation. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Professor Rana Mitter, who is here with me in human person. Um, I'm sure many of you will know Rana. Uh, he's one of the leading thinkers, writers, scholars on China in the UK, um, has some wonderful books out, which we can plug at the end. Um, he's also a research collaborator of mine and friend. Um, and also very delighted to have with us Tom Tugendhat, who is the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, uh, also one of the founders of the China Research Group and uh, a very uh, able and um, enthusiastic commenter on China issues, but also on uh, the issues of um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, and all the other geopolitical stories that are connected to that. So uh, this afternoon, we're specifically going to be focusing on the China angle of this conflict. Um, and I think, you know, what we want to do is sort through the very legitimate questions that there are about China's role um, during, um, before and after the invasion of Ukraine. Um, but we also sort of want to sort the wheat from the chaff in understanding where uh, we might be misplacing some of our narratives about China's role, uh, uh, particularly this question about China's potential as a broker in the conflict. And we'll also be looking at the question of Taiwan, which I think has come even more sharply into an urgent focus uh, in light of the Russian invasion. So um, it's obviously very somber times, and we want to begin this session by just acknowledging the immense um, suffering and bravery and courage of the Ukrainian people. Uh, we're thinking of you all now. So I'm going to start by um, handing the floor to Rana. He's going to make some um, opening thoughts and, and then Tom will offer a few of his own. Um, and then we'll get into a bit of a conversation and we'll be able to call on uh, your questions as the audience. So um, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A function. Um, please lob all your questions um, of varying degrees of difficulty and provocation towards us and we'll do our best to get through as many of them as possible. So without further ado, I will hand over to Rana. Thanks very much indeed, Sophia. And a huge pleasure and privilege to be here with two amazing minds, Sophia and Tom, who I'm also privileged to call good friends. And thank you for so many people for having joined us this afternoon. And I'd echo that sentiment that we're all horrified by what is happening with the Russian war in Ukraine and that a peace, but a just peace, we hope will come sooner rather than later. Let me start the conversation by making um, three, it's always three, but it is actually in this case, I think useful to have three very short points, but they might put some of the dilemmas that are facing China at the moment into perspective. And the reason I put these Chinese thoughts in is that I think that all of them will have some relevance for the UK and the way in which we as a country and as a society are going to have to respond to some issues which are going to become more urgent in the near future. So let me very briefly make those points. The first one is just to give a sketch for some who may not have had a chance to, to see it of how the Ukraine crisis, the Russian invasion, is going down in China itself. Now, it's well known, I think, that China has decided in terms of its domestic media, the social media and television and so forth, to launch a pretty pro-Russian framework, it has to be said. Most of the criticism of Russia has been removed from that kind of uh, public sphere, and most of the commentary tends to be leaning towards Moscow's point of view, even if it's not explicitly in that, uh, in that vein. But what's noted is that there is a significant body of public opinion which is leaking through, which is uneasy about China becoming too closely involved with the Russian invasion, partly out of principle on the grounds that if China believes in everything, anything, it believes in not breaching national sovereignty and whatever else you think about this, this is a clear breach of international borders, but also in terms of human sympathy. Um, I just mentioned one person known to, to many of you, I suspect, who've looked at this question, Wang Jixian, the uh, young IT entrepreneur in Odessa who has been blogging from Odessa for a Chinese audience. His audience has been cut off, but not completely removed, uh, in which he's making a very, very clear case that this is a case of aggression against the Ukrainian people and that he certainly stands with them. And he's become very popular in many parts of the more liberal parts of the Chinese public sphere that can uh, see him. So again, understanding points of view in China have variation in them. The second point is on, that's having been said, the Chinese official position. And I think it's worth noting 
and again, I know people like Tom and of course Sophia are very aware of this, we have to be very careful in the UK of assuming that our own framing, which is liberal and which is rightly, I think, outraged at what has happened in Ukraine, assuming that that framing necessarily is driving the way in which others see this conflict. And what China has seen quite clearly is that a large part of the world has, of course, you know, condemned the invasion um, on principle, but does not consider Ukraine to be an existential issue in the way that Western Europe has done. And China, therefore, when you think about its role of brokering, I think has put itself into a position officially of saying that there are many things that China can and would do if things become more peaceful. And just to give one example, using the Belt and Road Initiative, of which Ukraine, of course, is an official member um, as a gateway for reconstruction opportunity, of course, for China in that case, to be seen to be doing good, but also to be doing well. But in terms of actually getting actively involved in the talks in Turkey and elsewhere, I have my doubts as to whether China finds it sufficiently necessary to its own international image to um, actually push forward on that. Again, we may have disagreement or discussion on that later. The very final point that I want to make in the, the initial um, set of, uh, 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 of thoughts is about the way in which uh, China's take on Ukraine may or may not be relevant for Taiwan. I think that there are parallels to draw, but they are not necessarily the ones that suggest an immediate readover in terms of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia across a recognized international boundary being read over by the Chinese in terms of Taiwan, not least because their intellectual starting point, which you know is one that they've stuck to very firmly, is in fact Taiwan has always been part of the wider Chinese polity and therefore doing anything to it wouldn't actually be a breach of sovereignty. What I think they have gathered from that and how they use it is still to be seen, is first of all, seeing the importance of publicity, the way in which the Ukrainians so far are winning the media war, social media and so forth, with the figure of President Zelensky and others, very much as part of that. And Taiwan and Taipei in particular, of course, now a major media center, not least because many journalists have been uh, essentially forced to leave the mainland and they're now based on, 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 on Taiwan. But beyond that, and this is probably something I would like to believe rather than I necessarily have lots of proof of at the moment, but I'd like to think that in the more sensible parts of Beijing's think tanks, and there are plenty of them, the understanding that Russia has not least been pulled out of kilter has made a great mistake in its judgment because it believed its own propaganda. It believed or claimed to believe at its highest levels that Ukraine's government is full of drug dealing, neo-Nazis or whatever you know, particular fiction they came up with. I think if there is a rethinking in Beijing amongst the many very sensible people who work on foreign policy there, and there are plenty of them, that understanding that Taiwan's perception of itself is not the same as the mainland's perception, and this needs to be taken into account in any engagement with the island. Well, that can, I think, only set the path for perhaps a more reasonable discussion across the straits. And if that is a legacy of the horror in Ukraine, then perhaps that will be one that the UK can contribute to and might lead to greater calmness in the East Asian space. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rana, um, for that, Percy, and just so many <laughs> different threads that I want to pick up in our discussion. But now I'll hand over to Tom and then we'll uh, come back together to start getting into the meat. Well, um, as usual, when I uh, rashly agree to do a, a panel with Rana, I find out that once he's spoken, I find myself rethinking everything I was going to say and wondering whether I've got anything to add. Um, the reality is I probably don't, um, but but I'm going to I'm going to do it anyway because I'm a politician and that's what we do. Um, it is first of all a huge pleasure to be with uh, Sphere and, uh, and and with Rana, two very good friends and uh, two of the most insightful observers of the of the world as we see it. And I'm struck that um, we're correctly, and I think for me, the first time talking about China and Russia rather than just Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So first of all, congratulations on putting this on. You've at least made, uh, for me, a more interesting discussion than I would formerly have had. Uh, I hope for others too. One of the things that really strikes me about this is the, is the short-termism of the Russian decision. Because what it's demonstrating is a very, very proximate issue for the Russian regime. We're seeing President Putin responding to uh, not actually, I think, the expansion of NATO, as he would put it, but actually realistically to the uh, increasing success of a democracy on Russia's borders. And that proximity, uh, both in physical and in um, uh, uh, temporal, on a temporal basis, has caused him to act in a way that I think is extremely short term. His attack demonstrates that he doesn't think he can do the salami slicing in the slow way that he had been doing before. He'd been, you know, as he'd done in Donetsk and Crimea. 
It demonstrates that he didn't think that his influence operations were working uh, and that he wasn't going to be able to uh, install a new puppet regime without force. Now, I find that all very interesting, and I'm sure I'm not alone because the other people who will be thinking of the same thing will be aging leaders in Beijing. They will be looking to the east and they will be wondering how much time they have left. They will be looking uh, to the regimes and wondering how much influence they've actually had. Because if you look at the elections that Taiwan has had, not just the most recent one, but in fact, a couple uh, over the last couple of elections, you're seeing a growing movement, not of independence, that would be, that would be wrong, but a growing movement of increasing Taiwanese democracy. Now, Taiwan as part of China, sure. Taiwan as part of the uh, One China policy, fine. But still, Taiwanese democracy seems to be growing. Now, if I were sitting in Beijing, I would be looking at what uh, President Putin did and wondering. I'd be wondering several things. The first I'd be wondering was, was this sense of urgency, was it misplaced? Did he go too soon? Or did he go at a time when he thought that every other option was going to close down anyway? So this was his last hope, his Hail Mary pass, as it were. I'd be looking at, yes, of course, I'd be looking at the difficulty of the conflict and the unity of the West and seeing both of those as, to some degree, a bit of a surprise. I mean, I, I don't suppose we were alone in thinking that the operation would be over in a few days. Certainly, uh, the Russians did. I suspect the Chinese did. And the reason I suspect that is because some 20,000 Chinese students were not withdrawn from Ukraine in advance of the operation, despite Beijing knowing very well that it was coming. So one can only assume that they saw it was coming and thought that there'd be a, you know, a change of regime, but actually more of the same. <clears throat> and the third thing is that you're seeing is you're seeing a change in uh, uh, an immediacy to the to the energy demands. Now, what we're seeing is we're seeing Russian energy continuing to flow west through Ukraine. As you know, this may be one of the reasons why. Russia isn't calling it a war. I mean, there are several reasons, but this may be one of them because it would have to cut off the energy supplies flowing through Ukraine. And that would, of course, uh, hurt its own budget levels. Uh, and, and I wonder when, I'm, when those in Beijing are sitting there watching this, what they're thinking. Because part of what they're thinking must be that energy prices running up as high as they are may be great for Russia in the short term. But in the not very long term, they're pretty bad for Beijing. Any energy consuming country, of which China is a major energy consuming country, will find the higher prices extremely difficult. So I wonder whether Russia's short term movements won't lead to some Chinese uh, long term rethinking. The first element of rethinking is I suspect that those who were pushing for a military res resolution to Taiwan will be a bit quieter now. Now, I think that a military resolution to, to as, as Beijing would put it, isn't entirely necessary. There are many other things that, um, that the, uh, the Chinese state can do in order to uh, bring Taiwan, as it were, to heel. Uh, but certainly the military option now looks less likely. What does, however, look more likely is that Russia's dependency on China will increase, and therefore Russia's interests in uh, Siberia or northern Mongolia, as I suspect it's about to become known, uh, is going to be uh, increased as it looks at those gas fields for its own use. I think we're going to see an increasing pressure on many of those Chinese companies that have invested in states around the world, thinking hard about what it means to be dependent on Russian energy or indeed on anybody else's energy when you can, when the, the reality is that there's so much up for grabs if you go, and go out and get it. And now the third thing, <laughs> the last thing I wanted to bring up. We all know that Russia is obviously, uh, sorry, China is obviously a very energy hungry country. It's not just an energy hungry country, it's a hungry country full stop. It has, depending on how you count, uh, about 1.2, or sorry, depending on who you believe, rather, anywhere between 1.2 and 1.4 billion people. And uh, those people require feeding every day, as do we all. Uh, and with the loss of wheat in Ukraine, much of it went to the Middle East, of course, but with the loss of wheat and corn in Ukraine, the loss of fertilizers coming out of Ukraine and um, Russia, the chances of food prices rising are very high. Now, this isn't just an immediate issue for China. China will no doubt solve the immediate issue of feeding its population relatively quickly. But it's a secondary issue because so much of China's foreign policy has been based on investments in um, the global south in countries that have very great difficulty in already in uh, looking after their own populations and for whom all of this food unrest and energy unrest will generate significant political unrest. 
So the blowback on China's uh, provincial economies, because as you know, many, much of the investment that has gone overseas from China hasn't been done formally, as it were. It's not, it's not state investment, but many provincial banks, provincial businesses who've gone and invested in countries around the world. The blowback on provincial stability and provincial economic stability, sorry, could be very severe. So if I was sitting in Beijing today, I would be thinking three, I'd be thinking, first of all, Putin's short, a short term thinker, and that's a really bad place to have an ally. Second, I'd be thinking the bets that we've made on uh, Russian stability now look very uncertain. And those troops that we may need on, on the Siberian uh, border uh, should be doubled. And the last thing I'd be thinking is our investments overseas now look distinctly unstable. Now, those are three things that I suspect are already worrying Beijing uh, and now are likely to make it even more nervous. Thank you so much, Tom. I wonder, what I want to do is just dial back to the Beijing Winter Olympics, because obviously out of this meeting between President Xi and, and, and Putin, we did have this substantive IR international relations pact, which outlined kind of cooperation with several key initiatives, but also perhaps even more importantly, alignment of narratives and language in a way that we haven't seen before. But then we also had these questions about the discussions around those meetings and how they pertain specifically to the war. And I'm interested in both your thoughts about how we think those conversations might have played out, um, what uh, President Xi might have um, been seeking from President Putin with regards to those conversations, what kind of assurances, promises, considerations might he have been pushing on, um, and how they would have seen in the immediate aftermath of the invasion, um, areas that perhaps took them by surprise that had not fallen within the scope of those conversations. So what did they talk about, do we think? What did they ask for? Um, and, and how was the Chinese regime taken by surprise? Rana, do you want to say? Let me just throw a few thoughts in there because then Tom can, uh, as he sensibly should do, tell me where I've got it wrong. But a couple of things I think will have been in the conversation and almost as important to pick up on Sophia's point. I think there'll be a couple of things that they may not have brought up, but I think it will have been at both of their minds. So on the first category, in the first category, I mean, I think I agree with Tom that I think that there was some sense that something was going to happen in the minds of Chinese decision makers. The reason I say this is I remember having a conversation with a fairly prominent Beijing uh, Chinese think tanker um, in autumn of last year, in which he tried to persuade me at great length that people living in eastern Ukraine were, quotes, Russians really, which suggested that the idea that there might need to be a narrative about what was happening in eastern uh, Ukraine was being readied in Beijing. However, I still think, and you know, I have to prove wrong on this, but I, I have a sense that it was the, the kind of slice by slice idea, the idea that Donetsk, Luhansk, and these bits of Eastern Ukraine would be taken off just as Crimea had been, was really what was being floated around, not the idea of a full scale territorial invasion of the, of the whole uh, territory. And I still think that actually that will have taken the top leadership in China somewhat by, uh, uh, by surprise, or until us historians get to the archives one, one decade in the future, we'll, we'll, never, uh, we'll never know. And I think that level of partial knowledge will have um, probably fuel the following thoughts. I mean, first of all, one of the pieces of analysis, and by the way, one of the best pieces in the last couple of days that I've seen on this is by the wonderful Jude Blanchett at CSIS, um, Washington DC, who's pointed out that paradoxically, one of the effects of exactly what Tom's pointed out, which is the way in which Putin has slipped up and is seen in Chinese eyes to have slipped up, is in the short term, there may have to be an incentive, if only behind the scenes with finance and some other areas, to try and make sure that Putin doesn't actually kind of crumble and, and, and fall. In other words, that there is an incentive for China to make sure that a, a weakened but still viable version of Putin's regime stays in place, because actually that sort of suits them in a variety of, uh, of ways. But when I said that, and, and, and on the, that front, becoming a, a market essentially for bargain basement, cereal crops, uh, fossil fuels and so forth could be part of the, uh, of the mixture. But having said that, there are at least a couple of things that may have been mentioned in that conversation back at the Beijing Olympics on the 3rd, 4th February of, of uh, just last month. It feels like a million years ago, but actually it's only, only last month, literally, it's now March and that was, was February. And those two, I mean, of the many areas, two that I'll just mention, which I 
think will have been mentioned only in passing, but I think have to fit into our bigger picture of where this relationship might go. Number one is Central Asia where I think it is still fair to say that the coordination level between what China wants and what Russia wants is not operating on the same narrative. There is still resentment, uh, I think quite a strong one actually, in parts of Moscow, that essentially what had become the near abroad, you know, the Eastern equivalent of Ukraine in a sense, has now become much more of an area under significant Chinese economic influence because the Chinese have more money to, uh, to, to invest and have put forward a proposition that Russia simply can't afford. So I think that has caused some resentment. And the second, um, the second point, and this is something that, again, both Sophia and Tom, I think what I'd love to hear your, your views and those of the audience on this, the role of India. It's been noted that India, of course, abstain alongside um, China and various other actors in the United Nations. But of course, the fact that even now, something like 50% of India's arms and weaponry are sold to uh, uh, are sold by Russia, has to come up against the fact that if we're talking about one area that if there was a conversation about it, I would love to have been a fly on the wall. What on earth can she and Putin say to each other about the fact that China has a continuing border dispute with India, but basically the weapons that could be pointed against the PLA are being sold to them by Moscow. It is a very difficult situation that's essentially an inheritance of the, of, of the Cold War. And off the back of that, I think it does point out in small scale that wider sense that the idea of a completely smooth and frictionless relationship between these two powers, of course the pact is real, of course they're going to align with each other against Washington, but the idea that everything is lovely in the garden, I think, ignores some of these rather major realities like the position of India. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the sort of very live questions now for the West in the aftermath of this has to be, you know, what, what are we going to do collectively about weaning India away from Russian military hardware, um, which many, much of which still requires Russian military servicing, and whether or not there is a kind of longer term project, perhaps even an AUKUS style project that um, that could do that. Tom, uh, your thoughts on the Putin-Xi dynamic and, and where they might have been a little bit surprised or, or perhaps not in, in the context of the invasion? Yeah, look, let me just pick up very quickly on the India dynamic, because I think if you want uh, if you want to see what's going to change India's mind on Russian weaponry, just look at Ukraine, because the advert for the Russian tank or armoured systems versus the Enlor and Javelin is made absolutely clear every day. You know, the strike rate of our weapons against their, their armour is phenomenal. I mean, it's way above what we were expecting, and it demonstrates extremely capably that, frankly, you can buy Russian, but you'll buy twice. Can I make a very, very quick point off the back of that? I, I think in, in performance terms, and I bow to, to Tom, who actually, unlike many who speak on these, has proper military experience of, of his own. Two quick things, though. The one thing, and I'm sure no one in this call would do it, that I think is not going to go down well, I have no knowledge of anyone in the Indian government, but I can say this, is that telling India that it's got it wrong is going to get ex this conversation on exactly the wrong sort of path. So if it happens during the kind of quad negotiations, that's fine. But India needs to be leading the way in doing the rethinking rather than being told that it must do this or that. And the other question, which again, you know, you use a, a military man, um, Tom will know, is that switching the hardware is one thing, but switching the training, switching the, the back of the shop, switching the kind of long series of issues to do with maintenance and so forth is a longer and expensive enterprise. And with, as with so many things we talked about, whether it's 5G provision or you know, build back better world, there is a question of, is India expected to pay for this shift? Because if it is, the question of where the money is coming from will be, I think, the first one in the minds of, you know, Mr. Jayashankar and the other people who will be having this, this, this conversation. So uh, direction of travel may be one thing, but the mechanics will need to be discussed and in a very egalitarian manner. Yes, we can, I, sorry, Tom. It, it, I mean, it's just, it's it's a very different question talking about a kind of orca style agreement where you're pulling sovereignty versus a kind of, um, a project where we need to be competitive in those kind of infrastructure and technology projects as, as a tender, uh, whether that's individually or collectively within the West. So look, I, I agree. I mean, all I'd say is uh, the advert is clear in Ukraine and it's clear for everybody to see. This is not an India point, it's a general point. The second point is that India has been on this journey already uh, and they're not actually quite as much looking at the US, uh, sorry, at the US and UK. They're actually looking at countries very clearly 
um, uh, like France and Israel uh, as, as potential partners in this. Now, exactly how they go down, which line is going to vary down, whether you're talking about air or armor, whether you're talking about nuclear or whatever. So it, it's going to vary, but India's already started this journey. And what they, what they, I'm sure, are watching is what the same as everybody else is watching, which is that Russian technology has been found wanting in battle. And after all, that is fundamentally what the technology is for. Um, the, the rest of the question was actually about Putin and Xi. And, and here, I, I, look, I, I don't know any more what happened in those conversations than anybody else, but I, I strongly suspect, as Rana puts it, there were some things said and some things unsaid. And those things that were left unsaid were left unsaid by both parties. I mean, you don't need to read very much Russian history or Chinese history to see that the, the level of antipathy between the two countries means that although they do manage to cooperate sometimes, it, it tends not to last, right? It tends to be uh, brief moments of cooperation in long periods of hostility. Now, I hope for everybody's sake that we don't see hostility, but I do suspect that this cooperation is not going to endure particularly well. I think what we're likely to see, uh, or rather, sorry, what we're likely to have heard if we were listening to their minds rather than listening to their words, would have been a series of questions that each was asking about whether the other one was serious. You know, was Putin serious about uh, invading Ukraine? And if he was, what did that mean for Russian military prowess in other parts? Did it mean that Russia was going to uh, be a bit more belligerent in the East? Were they going to reassert themselves in North Korea, which, as you know, originally is a, is a Russian colony, not a, not a Chinese one? Um, you know, there's a whole series of questions that would have raised themselves, including in, in the Middle East, would Russia have reasserted itself in some of those areas where China is now a very important energy customer? You know, there's a whole series of issues that each would have been asking about the other. Uh, and though I, I think it's extremely unlikely that she wants uh, Putin to fail, I suspect he very much wants him to succeed. Uh, I'm not sure he wants him to succeed too much. Um, and so I, I think that there's a, there's a sort of happy balance here. I mean, on, on, on Putin's point, one of the first decisions he had to make was could he redeploy some of those forces from the Siberian Chinese frontier, from the Russian Chinese frontier, and push them west? Now that's, you know, you, you don't have to be, as I say, you don't have to be a long student of Russian history to see that's a bold move to make. And you'd be pretty secure and pretty sure that the, uh, the, the Chinese are not going to cross the border when you do it. Um, I wonder what he's thinking now. And I wonder what he's thinking about his own dependency and what it would mean for his own strength and, and the power of his own regime if he is seen to be too much of China's puppet. I wonder whether he will be feeling particularly vulnerable in areas of future gas negotiations, for example. While he can, of course, build the pipeline, couldn't Beijing just take the field? There must be some very serious worries for many Russian generals now, looking at their own capability and seeing that it might not be China's economic might that they have to fear, or after all, but their military might, because there must be many Russian generals who are looking at the same lesson as everybody else in Ukraine and wondering what capability there really has. That was one of the um, immediate uh, outcomes of that the P uh, Putin Xi meeting was this gas pipeline uh, conversation, which obviously was to uh, seek to diversify Russia's own uh, gas markets. And you know we know that China won that conversation about the routing of that pipeline. So I think even in that context before the invasion, it was very clear who the top dog in that kind of relationship was going to be. I think that's right. And again, I, I think what both Sophia and, uh, and Tom have pointed out is really important in terms of the practice practicalities of what China would like to get out of this. They, they got something similar in 2014 when we had the invasion of Crimea and then there was a brief period then before the West decided to, you know, wasn't that bothered about it, uh, where sanctions meant that the Chinese essentially managed to negotiate another extremely favourable deal on, on, on fossil fuels. If I might for a moment just get to Tom's other point about the level of trust or, or otherwise in terms of the military threat, I think it's worth putting in mind that in some ways, although this relationship has been very up and down over the last you know, 70 or 80 years between China and Russia, the two sides still sit with a rather kind of odd cultural view of each other. Um, I had a piece actually this yesterday in The Observer, which is free on the Guardian website, plug there for anyone who'd like to, to read it. And the way I summed up the kind of rather odd relationship between the two, which has genuine respect on both sides, but also sort of genuine sort of sense of slight scorn about what the other side does, that the Chinese have always found it odd that the Russians have this level of kind of culture and science and so forth, but have never really managed to turn it into the kind of capitalist go-go society 
that China has. And, you know, put the other way, the Russians think that they, you know, have this very strong sense of long culture that modern China has never put to, together. So the way I put it is that the, uh, the Russians slightly despise the Chinese for, sorry, the Chinese slightly despise the Russians for never having come up with Huawei. And the Russians slightly have contempt for the Chinese for never having come up with Dostoevsky. And in that sort of relationship between the two, you can see why it, it's something between the idea that they kind of can't stand each other, which isn't really quite the case, but also not the case that they have this kind of deep and long friendship that the rhetoric sometimes suggests. It is, it is a much more complex relationship, and that will play into the attitudes that Tom's talking about if they really have to get into joint military exercises, or even the working out of what an authoritarian alternative order in the world might be, where I think they see the world in very different ways, and each with themselves at the top of it. It strikes me that one of the areas, I mean, there's so many areas of our understanding of China that needs to be advanced and, and developed in, in pretty much every Western capital. But, um, you know, one of the areas that seems to be the most opaque um, is this question about China's intentions in the global community. How does it regard its own standing, its ambitions for its own standing? Where does it want to play in international institutions? Where does it see that favorable to its interests? And where is it happy to go on its own path? I mean, we've seen some pretty clear examples um, over recent months of the complexity of that, um, of that dynamic where, you know, for example, we've seen kind of, you know, trying to get ahead of COP26, announcing its own kind of um, non-Western-led um, environmental action program um, with some really substantive initiatives and kind of very much trying to take that, shop that around um, in parts of the developing world and, and trying to say that they're credible outside of the Western-led system. But then you've got other areas where they're kind of trying to play within the UN and so on um, in, in various capacities. So I'd be interested in both of your thoughts about this. So, uh, you know, China's own conception of itself within the international community, where is it concerned about its soft power in ways that we would understand with, with in the international community? Where does it see it as a, as a strategic utility? Um, and, and where is it perhaps um, more comfortable pursuing its own path or only playing lip service to those kinds of established institutions? Tom first this time, maybe? Yeah, Tom. Oh, why not? Um, uh, look, I, I mean, I think there's some really interesting questions there because th the reality is that both parties, though they do rage against the international community and the international liberal order or whatever they, we want to call it this week um, a lot, they, they do actually also rely on it um, and they use it uh, as well. I mean, it's quite clear that, you know, both China and Russia use their vetoes. They do turn up at the UN. They are active members in the, in the UN system, in the WTO. And, and they do, you know, they invest proportionally um, quite significantly in diplomacy, even if quite a lot of their diplomats end up being quite cack handed in the, in the way that they, they use their influence. And so it's not, it, it wouldn't be right to say that what they're trying to do is set up a totally alternative system. I don't think that's correct. What they're trying to do is they're trying to change the system towards their interests. Now, on one level, you could say that's fair enough, aren't we all? Uh, on another level, I would say, yes, but ours is in the cause of liberty and theirs is not. Um, and so I think I think it's a reasonable response. But I think I think the interesting thing is is where you look at the, the points, the pinch points of concern. I think for China, one of the big pinch points of concern has come with the dollarization of the economy, uh, or rather the uh, and the increasing dollarization of the internet, and therefore even of their own economy. Uh, and so they're finding it very difficult to 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 push back. I think that's one of the areas where they are deeply concerned, and certainly. One of the things that has come out of the Ukraine um, incidents and the war that uh, Putin has spread is they have seen, I think, probably more to their surprise than not, that actually the international community is willing to not just do things they expected, like close down SWIFT, which I think they've factored in, uh, and which why they're sort of looking at alternative systems, but actually the, the international community is willing to go further and seize central bank assets. Now that's a that's a very big change if you're a, a, a global major global economy. It's a huge and it's a huge thing to do, and I think the Chinese state is currently looking at that and wondering what it means for the if you like the international order. I think from China's uh, from Russia's perspective, I think again you know though they will rail against the UN and rail against the various different resolutions and all the rest of it um, uh, all the time. The reality is they 
they're not trying to bring it down because they know that you know they're, they're no longer this is no longer the world in 1946 47 they're no longer guaranteed that seat at the table and if these things were renegotiated um you know it would be almost impossible to deny germany japan india and probably several other countries a standing at least similar to and possibly greater than russia so i don't think russia is looking to to pull this down it's i think it's looking to use the force it can just enough to give itself an advantage but not so much that it causes people to have to rethink the entire system i think those are probably the points i'd make on that uh, a quick follow-up on on that. Um, I mean, I think that seems to me very well put. Um, in response, I, I, if I were to sort of vocalise, and I hasten to add this is not my view, but if I were to vocalise what Beijing's response might be, Tom, to your point about, you know, ours, meaning the West's cause is the cause of liberty, they might argue their cause is the cause of order. And while, of course, these two things are not incompatible with each other, I think they would put forward very strongly the idea that actually the creation of something that is calm and stable, as they would argue, you know, within China's own borders, is not necessarily um, an entirely bad thing in a world which is clearly, you know, suffering from a great deal of, uh, of turmoil. But there sits the philosophical argument, which I think that, you know... I'll, all... I'll, I'll leave you to make Beijing's argument for now, Rana. We'll... I, 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 I'm <laughs> merely passing it on, certainly <laughs> not, that, not endorsing it. I hasten to add to this audience. No, I know, I know. Let, let me add a couple of quick notes about where I think in terms of this question of order, things going, just two points, I, I, I think, but I think they, 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 they're, they're interesting to think of in this context. First is, I mean, and again, Tom, I think is absolutely right. I do not think China is trying to rewrite the world order, not least because it finds many aspects of that order actually very useful for the purposes that it wants to put forward, not least that project of domestic order linked to global order. But one area where I think it's looking for and finding influence is not in the parts of the world where I think it knows that it's not going to make much purchase, you know, Western Europe, North America, Australia, these sorts of places. Instead, it's in the parts of the world where there is still a sort of more fluid sense of order, the Indian Ocean space, the Arctic, many parts of the emerging global south where markets are still fluid, where there's an opportunity, where people want entirely justifiable things like better 5G or you know, uh, infrastructure for transport or other areas where I think that um, China, at least in the short term, has been able to put forward propositions that many people find attractive. And it's a challenge to us in the West, if we don't like that, to find alternative ways to, um, uh, to, to say that we have a better offer of, uh, of our own. Linked to that, and this is one of the things that I think is emergent, but I think is becoming clearer, is that there is one school of thinking about great power relations in China. It's not necessarily the only school or even the most dominant one, but it's becoming more noticeable, which draws in part on certain sort of Confucian ideas, you know, pre-modern philosophical ideas, which is actually that certain types of hierarchy and society can be um, effective. Um, the um, Actually, the Canadian scholar who works in China, Daniel Bell, has written quite effectively about this in his recent book, Just Hierarchy, a couple of uh, years ago. It's you know uh, a, a book that not everyone will agree with, but it's well worth reading. In this argument, Russia's case that basically because it's a large power in Europe, it does have some rights over what happens on its, its borders, is something that the Chinese, I think, would find in some way sympathetic. Remember that um, now foreign council, but then foreign minister Yang Yichu back in 2010, at Hanoi got a bit annoyed with the other members of ASEAN and blurted out perhaps what he didn't mean to say, a bit like President Biden, when he said, look, the thing is, China's a big country and you're small countries, and that's the way it should be. The flip side, and it's always worth remembering this, is that if you go for Confucian order, then the point is that the larger state has a duty of benevolence to the smaller neighbors. They're not simply supposed to be able to just walk in or invade or blow up blocks of flats or, or hospitals with children in them. That's not part of the Confucian contract. So I say, if you're going to push forward the Confucian idea of international relations, you have to do both parts. If you want the hierarchy, you have to have the benevolence as well. Interesting. I want to bring in a couple of um, audience questions, uh, and please do keep putting them in the Q&A function if you can, um, rather than the chat function. It's just easier for us to get to. But um, there's obviously a lot of questions about Taiwan, so this is a good chance for us to get into this very central question. There seems to be an increasing consensus that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has delayed a, any planned kind of Russian, uh, Chinese seizure of Taiwan. Um, we can debate that, uh, that question in and of itself. Um, but I think it necessarily compels the question of what we would do now if we know we've got 
five years, 10 years until this happens, um, what should we be putting in place to make sure that we are in the best possible position and Taiwan is in the best possible position to go into that situation? Um, and particularly, how should we be thinking in terms of economic sanctions? Because I think obviously the sanctions that are unprecedented that we have leveled against uh, Russia, against the Russian state, Russian banks, Putin's regime, Putin himself, um, you know, they're substantive, they're significant, they are obviously accelerating various kind of energy and cost of living crises that we've been going through in the West anyway, which do, do will have significant domestic political uh, consequences in, in advanced democracies. But I think it feels plain to see that the level of economic entanglement um, with China is considerably greater. So how should the West be preparing for um, a potential uh, effort by the Chinese state to bring um, Taiwan further into its control and sphere of influence? Um, and how should we be thinking about the approach that we would take to our economic entanglement um, to particularly help us with regard to the question of future sanctions? Um, who wants to that? Tom, do you want to jump in? Um Sure. I mean, the, 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 question of, the question of Taiwan delayed, I'm not sure I buy Taiwan delayed. I, I, I'm more by Taiwan changed. I think, I think look, that, I don't think there's ever been a particularly strong militaristic voice uh, calling for the invasion of Taiwan, but, but it's been there. It's been an important voice, um, but I think it has got more silent. So I, I'm not, I wouldn't argue that the desire to unite, as, as they would put it, um, China into one great communist whole has been delayed. I think the I think the means with which it, it's being sought to be achieved has been varied because I think you know however easy you, or hard you think that um, uh, the invasion of Ukraine has been, and however critical you are of Russian generals or the Russian military style, uh, it, it's very hard to argue that rolling tanks across a flat border on your neighbourhood is not much much easier than crossing very very difficult waters. Uh, and then attacking a mountainous island. I mean, you know, it, it just simply is. I mean, the, the military effect of fighting on flatland versus up mountains, trust me, it's, you notice the difference. Um, and so I strongly, I strongly suspect that those voices who, who, were, who said there is a military option are now quieter, not that the desire to unite Taiwan, uh, as she would put it, with Beijing has eased. I suspect he's just looking at different ways of doing it. So I'd just, I'd just be cautious on the delay argument. Um, Sorry, forgive me. I then I now managed to completely forgot what, forget what you were asking about. Sorry, what was the question? Is how how should the West, if if the West accepts that that remains a prospect in some form, whether it's oh yes, how should we react? Yes. How should we prepare and react? Thank you. Forgive me. Sorry. Um, the um, look. I, I mean, I think I think the key element that we've got to pursue is one of uh, making sure that we respect. Uh, Taiwan's wishes consistently. And we've got to be careful here. You know, we have always uh, recognized Taiwan's democracy as being determinant on its desires. And at the moment, its desires are not to stir up Beijing by calling for independence. So, you know, I think we should be, you know, we should, we should recognize that too. And that means that we have to recognize that some things we may wish to do or may have thought we wish to do, like um, supporting the military uh, buildup of Taiwan, need to come from them, not from us. Um, so I think I think the key is to make sure that we uh, respond to those uh, requests that uh, that are available to us. But what we can do, independent of Taiwan, if you will, is we can look at supporting the environment in the region. And this is where I'd like to see AUKUS, including Japan and India, for example. I'd like to see greater investment you know, in terms of both time and economics into countries like Indonesia and the Philippines, and making sure that you know, there is an environment there that isn't American, that isn't Western, but is democratic, into which a uh, an autonomous, if not independent, Taiwan can quite happily sit. I just, I mean, that's all, you know, very, very sensible points. So I think I'd just add one here, partly because I think it's one of the toughest ones, actually, to get an answer on, and in the kind of amateur way, you know, chatting to people, I, I've tried to, to, to do so, which is this. It's still not clear 
quite what a Beijing controlled Taiwan, assuming that in military and economic and security terms, such a thing were possible. And by the way, Tom, I think is right that anyone who actually looks at the mechanics of a physical you know, amphibious invasion of Taiwan would see that it, it's very, very difficult to, to do. And the Chinese are perfectly aware of that. But the wider sense of what it is that they want it to be. I mean, it, it, until a few years ago, the answer was that you know, Hong Kong sat there as this perfectly happy example of how a relatively free society could be placed within a wider um, uh, communist run authoritarian society and the two sat by each other kind of quite uh, comfortably that obviously you know basically disappeared as an option in, in, in 2019 and then the mainland seemed to be somewhat disconcerted by the way in which Tsai Ing-wen won re-election through the slogan you know today Hong Kong tomorrow Taiwan which turned out to be essentially the making of her in terms of re-election which looked a bit uncertain until that um, until that point so the question of what it is that Beijing has to offer any of the bodies within Taiwan with which it hopes to actually have that dialogue seem to become more and more opaque. Um, if there is you know, a sense in which they can offer any kind of political solution that involves the things that most people now think are fundamental to Taiwan, its freedom of speech, its freedom of media, its capacity to maintain a free, lively, and sometimes quite raucous um, democracy, its connections to the outside world, you know, all of these sorts of, of things. No picture has emerged at all from Beijing that anyone can see about precisely how those things would be preserved and indeed enhanced in any political solution offered by Beijing. And simply ignoring the question and saying that's not the business of anyone else. Clearly, it was the business of other people just a generation or so ago when Beijing used to produce white papers that looked remarkably liberal in the way that they proposed a solution to, uh, to, the, to the Taiwan question. It's time, I think, for more of that to be, to be heard as part, no doubt, of what China wants to put forward, which is the idea that it is a reasonable interlocutor rather than another Russia in Ukraine. It's interesting, actually, the Tom, your comments about, you know, the, our presence and the presence of our allies in, in the region and whether that's a scale up of quad or scale up of AUKUS or so on. I mean, it, it seems to me there has been a resurgent conversation about whether or not, um, you know, this idea of the UK between an Indo-Pacific tilt it has legitimacy or whether that's been challenged in any fundamental way by the nat particularly the nature of the conflict in, in Ukraine. I mean, my conclusion on that is that it, it sort of hasn't really, because I don't think we really have a choice. It was always going to have to be that we have several spheres of security, of, of our security paradigm, and that we need to find a way to resource as both as well as we possibly can. I just want to get to this question about the West, because we, uh, Tom, you raised this at the beginning, the question about how the West had come together. It does feel um, stronger in some ways than perhaps we had anticipated, but it also feels very fragile and continues to be a live question. How confident do you feel about the idea of a kind of enduring, functional, uh, Western alliance over the coming, say, five, ten years, with particularly with America that perhaps will not necessarily be the sort of centrifugal force, the driving heartbeat of such an alliance. Is that feasible or and and do you think that that is actually necessary in this context of kind of rising authoritarian powers? Is do we need to think of ourselves? as a kind of liberal identity, does the Western Alliance still have value and meaning? And what are the prospects really for that, um, being able to kind of endure in any way uh, through the turbulence that we can probably imagine is coming over, over the next decade? So look, I, I mean, I think, I, first of all, I'm slightly uncomfortable with the term the West because it so obviously includes Australia, uh, you know, Japan and South Korea. And there are many things you can say about those states, but none of them are Western. Um, they, they are, they're all democratic, they're all liberal, they're all, uh, you know, they're all essential parts of, of, of the global rules-based system, as it were, but, the, but, but they are quite distinctly in the East. Um, and so I, I'm, it's not the term, but, the, but I think your point is absolutely right. I think your point about the Indo-Pacific tilt, um, having been seen as, you know, perhaps premature or anachronistic, depending on your perspective, I think is entirely wrong. I think if you can't walk and chew gum, then frankly, you're going to find that um, one, part of, one part of your security architecture leaves a gaping hole for the rest of it. And the reality is that you know, we do need to deal with the, the challenges that China poses 
uh, even as we uh, address the immediacy of, of Russian aggression in Ukraine. And, and I think the enduring nature of that uh, alliance and, and, the, and, and the binary or rather the dual nature of the threat are absolutely essential because if we do not participate, uh, here I say uh, we as the UK, but if we do not participate in supporting allies in South Korea and Japan, Australia, Indonesia, the Philippines, and, and indeed Taiwan, then we're going to find out that when we call for the sanctions on Russia, say, um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be a little less, uh, less supported and a little more lonely. Uh, and so I think this is actually extremely important uh, and, and essential to making sure that we're a proper global partner. Anna, what do you think? Does, I mean, how, does, how do you think that China anticipated the West would respond? I mean, clearly Putin was being extremely opportunistic. There were a number of different factors that contributed to him thinking this was the best possible moment to do this. And one of those was without doubt the uh, allied withdrawal from Afghanistan and the sense that the Western alliance perhaps was lacking some kind of cohesion or leadership or, or kind of productive forums through which to kind of coordinate these responses. It, he knew that he would be pulling at some of the most visceral aspects of domestic mm. politics as well um, in this. He's obviously made some profound miscalculations about it, um, but how do you think that China was expecting the war to play out in terms of the Western response? Sure, I think there are probably two elements of that. The first has been going back to what we were saying earlier. I think that the anticipation, I suspect the anticipation in top echelons of, of Chinese policymaking was that there was going to be an attempt after the Winter Olympics to do another kind of bit of salami slicing. And I think that they would have anticipated, rather as Putin uh, would have done, you know, after 2014, that the West would have got angry for a while and then basically gone back to the status quo with, uh, you know, a, a calming down of relations fairly soon afterwards. Once it was clear from the end of February that this, in fact, involved a full scale assault on uh, on on Ukraine, I still think actually the expectation of most of the actors in Beijing would have been something quite similar to what's happened. In other words, I think that the policymakers in Beijing, if you look at a lot of what the policymakers actually write about the way in which they see the coming sense that the world order is changing, is that they do see the Western world as seeing a more existential kind of crisis emerging. Some of the phrases, and again, I think Tom and Survey, you've probably seen this in some of the, the writings you've seen, phrases that are used very frequently now in Chinese policy writing, such as, there are changes afoot that have not been seen for a hundred years. And this phrase, um, and phrase and versions of it, I think has heightened the sense actually in Beijing that whatever's happening, change is gonna to come to, uh, to use that, that, that phrase. And therefore the sense that that is realized in the West and that the West will pull out the stops. I mean, in the wider sense of the West. By the way, I think I'm okay using the term West, although I, I take Tom's sensitivity. The reason being that some of the most important Chinese documents, which actually push back against the idea, use that phrase Xifang, meaning the Western world, to include actually Japan and various other actors as well. So it's seen conceptually as, as, as a set of countries in the Chinese side um, uh, as well on, on many, uh, many oh. cases. So, anyways, yeah, all I'm saying is that I, I think they may have been less surprised than we might be. We, we might have might have thought at the comprehensive nature of the pushback from the liberal world. True, but I, I think I think the Chinese phrase is used pejoratively to suggest that Japan is really under the control of the West rather than an independent actor with the similar values too. Is, is that not a fair reading of the, the way that the Chinese I, writers work? I, I think that's true, but what, also one of the, um, I think, failings, if I may put it that way, that exists both in the US um, foreign policy establishment and the Beijing foreign policy establishment is that they both assume that other countries don't really matter very much. So Europe and Japan and so forth are seen essentially as you know tools of US policy. And that was one of the reasons, actually, of the many reasons why China found the Trump administration quite so difficult to figure out because the idea of a sort of lockstep um, association of countries with the same goals were thrown very much into question by the uh, the policies of, of the Trump administration, or at least not the policies, the attitudes of the, of the Trump administration. Many of the policies actually were slightly less 
out of kilter than they might have appeared. But the language about everything from NATO to the role of Japan, which I think President the candidate Trump famously said uh, was a country that quotes sat around watching Sony TV while America paid for their um, uh, for their defense, were very much noted and debated in in Beijing. I mean, I think to your point, Tom, about the West. I mean. It seems to me that we've got kind of two processes that we're having to grapple with at the same time. And in one in one level, we need to be taking a much more hard-nosed strategic decision about partners, and that's going to have to be more expansive. We talk about, you know, liberty in liberal countries and open countries, and that they may have different aspects of their society and economy that are open um, and, and which will work with where our interests align. Um, it seems to me that that also needs to be underpinned by a process of becoming much more um, cohesive and, and, and cooperating on a much deeper level with um, partners that we do really feel also share our values and some sort of instincts about the world. Just, we are about to be out of time, but I want to ask one exceedingly fast question for a final thought, which is, I'm very skeptical on this. Uh, and <laughs> so it's not my view, but what do we think? Is it legitimate for China to be seen or cast as a broker in uh, some kind of next phase of Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Tom. Um no, bluntly, um, and, and I don't think it will attempt to be one either. Uh, I think China is very uncomfortable with the idea of being a, a broker because, of course, it, it, it hits several of its own red lines, which is a very obvious interference in somebody else's business, uh, possible acceptance of breakaway provinces. You know, it would, it would raise too many difficult questions for the Chinese state to be able to resolve as part of its duty. So I suspect that China will be one of the first countries to avoid being seen as a broker. And I think for our own reasons as well, I don't think that would work particularly effectively. There we go, that's my view. <laughs> um, briefly, I don't think it would be illegitimate at all, actually, but I just don't think it's very likely for the reasons that Tom has put forward. What I do think is more likely is that if we do come to some sort of agreement within the next, you know, let's hope days, but perhaps more likely weeks or, or months, that China will seek to use um, Ukraine status as a Belt and Road Initiative member and its own particular narrative of post-civil conflict development, which I'll point out it has experience in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere, rather different from the Western experience, and use that as a means of basically portraying itself as an actor who has something to offer to the reconstruction rather than necessarily the peace, peace negotiations. Whether that's accepted in the wider world, Remains to be seen, but you know, unless lots of other people are pouring up with whatever I, I think the, the news had sort of four hundred eighty billion dollars worth of damage in Ukraine that needs to be dealt with, then the Chinese might find themselves actually with a political class that at least wants to hear some of what they have to say. Another reminder uh, that this question about the China Chinese role in this conflict um, will not be going away anytime soon. Uh, we have promised a hard stop, and um, we will deliver one. So. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Tom and Rana. Uh, this has been so useful and fascinating as ever. Uh, wonderful to have you as kind of research thinkers, collaborators, and friends. Um, you're absolutely two of the best in the business. So it's been a real privilege to host you here for the British Foreign Policy Group. Um, we've actually got a new paper out today, which I'll just quickly plug, which is looking at the integrated review and this question that we've touched on uh, as to whether or not it remains kind of fit for purpose as, as a strategic framework a year on, given all the events. Uh, that's free on our website as well. Um, Rana, you have, so a few books and articles. Do you want to give them a quick oh, Well, uh, uh, since time has lived, I'd just say uh, do go to the Guardian website to see my take on history and its role in China and Ukraine, and also a couple of weeks back in The Spectator on the relevance for Taiwan in particular. Tom, anything you want to plug for no, the... Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to plug Rana's work. I've, I've been reading. Uh, he's, he's on one of my Google alerts. The, the great advantage that you and I both have, Rana, is we have weird names. So it pings up quite accurately rather than a scatter gun. Well, Tom, as, we as, as the politician, you are the product. So uh, here we are. <laughs> We're delighted to offer a platform um, to both of you. And thank you very much to the audience for all those really excellent questions. Um, clearly, there is scope um, for having more of these conversations um, over the coming weeks and months. Again, just to close by offering our thoughts and prayers with the people of Ukraine. We're with you, we see you, um, and that we hope that 
uh, things can de-escalate um, as soon as possible. So um, thank you, everyone. Uh, we will be we've recorded this and we'll be sharing it with our subscribers as well. So um, not to worry if you couldn't make the whole of it. Um, but thank you. And we'll see you soon at the Bridge Foreign Policy Group. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye.